okay? Meaning that the DIA would, uh, the UDAO, excuse me, would have more movement percentage-wise, and you might be hitting a trigger point on your spread as opposed to DIA. Speaking of DIA, let's get to John's question, second question in. Now, I should mention, Sam also had uh, said in his email that, you know, we can talk about this uh, indicator that he uses, the, uh, uh, it's a Morningstar reversal indicator, the Morningstar reversal, which he says is really reliable, but it didn't work on Apple today. Well, I, I can't really comment on it one direction or the other. I've never studied it. I've never looked at it. That doesn't mean it's a bad indicator at all. It just means that I use other indicators, so I can't really comment on a Morningstar or a VectorVest stock indicator or option indicator because I don't know what it is. I don't know what they're putting into it, uh, so I can't really comment on that as well. And Sam Diz mentioned that those options that he was talking about um, uh, in relation to that are further out to May. Uh, he's not doing anything on UDAO right now. He's mostly got the DIA spread and the DIA position uh, and so forth. And uh, he's looking at that going forward, and he's got the options out to May as well. And he mentioned that the uh, the reversal indicator for Morningstar is based on the candlesticks. Okay. Um, all right. So, but let's go ahead to John's question now. Speaking of DIA, John has opened a married put on DIA, radioactive trade, on January 3rd. The cost was 248.74. And at the same time, let me see here. Yep, good. Just want to make sure that was there. At the same time, of course, he bought the January 2020 255 put. Here we go. The cost was 24.26. Okay, now. Okay, this is the most profitable one. All right, so we've got a position here. We see the stock is now moved just above the put strike price. We're probably at profit on this position. We're going to take a look at that in a moment. Commonly structured, perfectly structured radioactive trade. It is out two years, but with low volatility, the max risk for two years out to 2020 is only 6.6%, 3.3% per year on the position. So this is a properly structured trade. It does give us a couple of extra opportunities to roll it since he bought two years out in time. Now, John's main question is related to the portfolio. As you're tracking any position, oh, hey, sorry, Sam, that was from a previous discussion we had. But uh, let me just do this here. We're going to call this, oops, should have highlighted that form. We're going to call this DIA RPM. I'm going to do something with this as well, but it's already, sorry, it's already got the information I want entered for this position. We're going to put it in the portfolio from January 3rd, 2018. And I can tell you why that there's no rollout opportunity shown. John's question is that when I'm tracking a position, a married put, and the stock moves up to a certain price, I should be able to go to position actions and then position analysis. This will show me a breakdown of my current position. You currently have a gain of about 2.1, 2.2% on the position after nine days. And of course, the max risk at expiration is 5.5%. Why isn't it 6.6%? .6 well, because the stock's above the put strike price. That's the worst case scenario out to 2020 is a loss of 6.6 .6 only if the stock's below 255. Okay, excuse me. Now, the stock's above the put strike price, which is usually an interesting time to do an adjustment or an income method. But John's noticing that there's no rollout opportunities that are being shown. Why? Because when we teach the blueprint, we teach, hey, if the stock's above the put strike price, you should be able to roll the position, or you should see opportunities to maybe sell a call or do a different income method. All right, here's the reason. As a general rule, although we do use the put strike price sometimes as a trigger, and in this case, I'd consider it using income method number four right now anyway with a stock at 257.91. The issue is, as a general rule, we want to see the stock move up 5% before we see an income method available. It's just a general rule. Sometimes with these ETFs that have a lower volatility, you can see a 2% move and be at the strike price where it might be an opportune time. And since it's a general rule, 
some of the other general rules that when I sell a call, for example, income method number one, I want the premium to be equal to a third or at least a half of my original at risk. And I also don't really want to go more than 45 days out in time. Okay, So the two things right there, why aren't you seeing an income method number one or number four or number six? Well, the first thing is it hasn't moved up 5%. That's actually programmed into the system that it looks for a movement of at least 5%. And in some cases, it will also show 5% or the stock is above the put strike price. Okay, but We're still not seeing any. Now, it's possible that for income method number one, there's no calls that can be sold within 45 days that represent one-third to one-half of the risk. Even though you have a low risk of 6.6% .6 out to 2020, because of low applied volatility, the calls might not be there. Now, for a roll, going from the 255 to the 260, for example, now that the stock is between the strike prices, for income method number four, in addition to wanting the stock to be up at least 5% as a general rule of thumb, we also want to make sure that this lowers the risk by at least half in most cases, or at least by about 2%, depending on the original at risk. So those are some of the qualifications as to why you might not see an income method or rollout opportunity. The main reason I can tell you is this. The stock hasn't moved up 5%. It's sort of a hard-coded thing in there, but if it goes above the put strike price, it likely will usually trigger an adjustment if it's available and matches the other guidelines. What's written in the blueprint is kind of programmed into the portfolio tool as a rule of thumb. So again, when it doesn't come up, what am I going to do? Well, from that position actions menu, I could click on the what if calculations link here when I don't see any rollout opportunities. And that just takes us back to the profit and loss chart for your position. Is income method number four viable? I'm starting off with a maximum risk of 1800 or 6.6%. And my preference, the stock is between the two strike prices. So let's take a look. Let's go out to 2020. Hopefully I can get midpoint here, but let's do the 255. So it's, we're looking at $2.80 bid ask spread. So hopefully if I got a dollar forty, this would be at twenty seventy. Could sell to close it at twenty seventy. And the twenty six put, I'm sorry, the two sixty put, that's dollar uh, three dollars even. All right. So hopefully I could get midpoint at dollar fifty, no guarantee. But let me sell to close this two fifty five put. We're going to realize a loss of two or three dollars. And we're going to roll up to the twenty six. Okay. So First things first, in order to do this, I'm adding a debit of 205 to gain five points. Okay, This matches another rule of thumb. I want to make sure that the, de the debit I'm paying is less than 60% of the increased payout. In other words, I wouldn't pay a debit of more than $3 to increase my return or guaranteed exit by five. Okay, So that's there. It only lowered the risk by 1.1%. Okay, I really want to see. We really want to see that a little bit more. When I do income method number four and add a debit to the position, I'd like to see the debit drop or the risk drop by almost in half, from 6.6 .6 to about 3.3, or at least by about 2% or so. Okay, this one doesn't quite match. It's not a bad move. Don't get me wrong. We still lowered the risk already. It's still out to January 2020. Uh, you could even roll it in if you wanted to. You could roll it into 2019, roll it up and strike and down. You might be able to actually roll for a credit and increase your payout by 260. That might look pretty good, but you shortened your time frame by a year. Okay, now, this one aside. Maximum risk again, $1,800 for 100 shares. Selling a call. Let's go out at least 30 days. We'll go to standard February expiration. And I want to give myself some room, so I'm going to go to the 260, which is at about two dollars. Okay. Remember what I said? I really don't want to go more than 45 days out of time, and I'd like this to represent at least a third of the maximum risk, about a 2.2 percent premium on the position. This is only about 0.7 for 35 days. It's likely another reason why you didn't see it 
as a rollout opportunity. Number one, the stock wasn't up minimum of 5%. Number two, the risk on the call, let any call less than 45 days out of time, which is in a reasonable strike range, is not giving you at least a third to a half of the original at risk. Now you have an extended put, don't get me wrong. What do I mean by extended put? You're out to 2020. So when I say a third to a half, you might be able to lower that to maybe a quarter or a fifth because you have so many right cycles between now and 2020 expiration. Right? So you could lower that expectation. But as a general rule, the portfolio program is thinking about it as an RPM, you know, with a put out 12 months, maybe eight or nine months. So that first call, you want the risk to represent a third to a half of the original at risk. So if I had a 6% risk, I want to get about a 2% or 3% premium on the call. This is still at around one point, no, it's still around 0.9% or so. Okay, so it's not really, I'm sorry, 0.7%. It's really not reducing the premium as much as I want. It's not reducing that risk by as much as I'd want. Okay, a trade doesn't look bad. The profit and loss chart doesn't look bad, but it's based on the rules written in the blueprint, and that's why you're not seeing them. But anytime you don't see an adjustment come through in the portfolio, and you, you want to consider what opportunities are available, you want to go ahead and do it manually here on the position. Uh, the profit and loss chart, excuse me, um, as well. Uh, evaluate your income methods and make sure it matches your needs and your goals. I'm not saying you should do this, um, but you know what I mentioned was is I could sell our 255 2020 put now. I don't want to say ours, it's yours. So it's your trade, not mine. It's looking really good. Don't get me wrong. So we could sell this, but now if I bring it in a year and up and strike to the 260 you're going to get a credit of about six points. Is that right? Yeah, about six points. Okay, so you're getting about $6.12 if you get filled at midpoint, and you're going to the higher strike at 260. The risk is dropped to 2.6%. Now, I go to February, and I'm not saying you should sell the 260 call either based on your expectations if you feel DIA is going to continue to move up. Now sell it. You're at a 1.8% risk, but notice the return, the max premium return if the stock's rate at 260 on February expiration, about 3.3% is the same as just what we just saw. But now you've taken your risk down to 1.8% and you gave up a year of insurance to roll it closer in. But you rolled for a six-point credit and up and strike. You just gave up a year of time. And that might be okay, depending on the position of what your goals are and what your outlook is for as well. Okay, and in relation to this, and I'm, I'm not saying it's my thoughts on it, um, but Sam says uh, some of the thoughts out there is that the Dow Jones next stop will be 30K, $300 for DIA, and maybe it will happen but just one of the reasons he wanted to participate and why he was using the stock positions on DIA and the bull put spread. It's possible uh, that it could do that. But one thing I wanted to point out here as well, and I'm going to show another example of this. Let's go back home. I just had a conversation with a friend of mine. Um, oh, dear. Uh, I think my, my indicators might be slightly off because I program, I, I changed these myself a little bit. I changed the fences on some of these myself. But earlier today, from yesterday, our market sentiment tool, which looks at the 13 broad-based indicators on the market, was at 7 bearish, 6 neutral. The latest update here shows a bearish sell of 9 bearish indicators and 4 neutral and 0 bullish, where it's in a bearish sell mode. Okay. Now, Ed wanted to know, Ed E wanted to know, um, how much do I put stock in this? Actually, I put a lot in. And you see here what I have is the put call volume ratio went bearish, the number of uh, SPX gapped over the SMA 20s bearish, the number of new stock highs, new stock lows has gone bearish. The trend, the RSI of SPX, the SPX days over the SMA 20 over the 100 and the SPX gap over the 100 have all gone bearish. And things are pretty close 
as well. Now, yeah, the SPX number of days up right near that bearish mark. Now, what are these? Well, these indicators are the 13 indicators that Ernie selected and he tested over 10, uh, eight, 10 year period. And what he did is for each one of these, and there was about 20 to 30 he was evaluating, he looked at ones which indicated the market movement the best. Um, and what he did is he sent fences and says, well, this is bearish. The put call volume ratio goes bearish when we see a level below 0.6. When the ratio is below 0.6, it very rarely goes lower than that. So the market starts to reverse. Okay, the put call ratios start to reverse. And the last value is at 0.52. So we set all these fences for all of the different 13 broad-based indicators that he saw had the most reaction or were best indicators of those as well. Okay. And so the question is, do I put any, any faith in this or any stock in this? Yes, I do. And there's a little video you can watch here on the market sentiment tool and discuss is what I usually do. If I'm in a, co a heavy covered call portfolio and I see a bearish sell, I might add puts to create a collar when that triggers. If I'm in married put positions, as some of them I am in now, and I see the bearish sell come up, now would be a perfect time for me to sell a call, actually. I've already got the put in place, so maybe I can sell a call so if the market does pull back, I can buy those back more cheaply. Um, if I'm in bull put spreads, I may consider buying and close the short put if it's at a profit or exiting the position if it's at a profit because I don't want to see a profitable position turn into a loss in the next seven to eight days. Um, I'm just trying to think. If I'm in long calls, I might convert them to a calendar spread by selling a near-term call when the bearish sell pops up. If I'm in a diagonal put, I'll leave it alone because that's going to work in my favor. If in a bear call, I'm going to leave it alone. Or I might open a bear call on a broad-based ETF or index. And during the conversation I had with Ed, I actually didn't make any adjustments in my portfolio today. The short calls on my calendar spreads were expiring worthless or somewhere in the money, and I was closing the position anyway. I wasn't adjusting it based on this. I have a feeling I should have exited my CFG RPM today for a 5% profit uh, at the top. I'm worried about it pulling back and only having a 1% or 2% profit by Tuesday morning if there is a correction, if this turns out to be a reaction and we see some drop in the market on Tuesday and that's my fear. My fear is that it's a three-day weekend. That just gives us an extra day of something silly to happen. Global markets, foreign markets, or anything in the world where we could wake up Tuesday and see the broad-based index is down two, three, or four percent before we can even do anything. Okay, so in relation to what Sam was saying about the Dow hitting 3,000, it's possible but I also have to consider before it hits that, something's got to take a breath. And I know we've been saying that for months. Sam's been saying it with me for months. We've got to take a breather at some point. Um, and and it's, something's got to take a small breath. Not saying that it's going to go bearish all of a sudden, but we might have need a small break here. The market might need a small break before we see that. And I know Sam wasn't saying we're going to see it next week. He was saying that it's possible we could see it over the course of the year. But there's going to be movement between there, and this is something I would relate to. Now, one more instant. Back to John's question. Um, I'm going to use this as an example. I think I have it in my portfolio from last week. John commented, and then we'll get to the other question. He says, so Power Options calculates all the possibilities for you before offering rolling income opportunities. Yes, but again, it's based on the rules. And I thought I did this last week, and I didn't. I might have been on a completely different portfolio when we did our last webinar. I might have been on my real account instead of the webinar account. That's fine. Let me enter a new position into this December 1st structure. And I'm, I'm just going to enter a married put. And I think I'm going to get the numbers right here. It's from about two weeks ago. I think we illustrated this on our last webinar, or maybe I did it during one of the radioactive trading webinars at the end of December, beginning at the very end of December. I'm going to put in an RPM on AMAT, where around January 5th or maybe end of December, I could have gotten in at 51.50, okay? And then, oh, no, I don't want April. I would have gone July. I would have gone the 55 put, and I think we had this at 7.40 or 7.50. I'm going to be nice and say 7.50. And again, at 105, okay? 
this might not work, but we're going to try to get it to work. All right, so here's my AMAT married put, and the stock's only at 3.8%. So that's not, I know right away that's probably not going to cut enough. It, it was up at, that's why, because it was at 54.50 when I did it last time. Sorry, I need to cheat here, John. Uh, I need to edit this a little bit. So the position action shows me, oh yeah, I'm not even at a profit yet. So position action shows me that I got to do something here. I got to edit this position very quickly for us all. Cheating, but it's okay. We're going to go 50-50. Okay. Now, stocks at 50-50, bought the put at 750, so I had $58 invested in the position. The stock is up 5.8%. And of course, we know I've given some of that back due to the put, so I'm not realizing the full profit. Now, John, as I'm tracking this position, we'll go to position actions and position analysis once more. Here's my RPM here, 5.2% risk, that's about right. Liquidation value is 1.7%, yeah, so I should be making about 50% of the gain, I'm not. We know that if I hold it all the way to expiration, the stock's still at this point, down 5.2%. Here we go. Doesn't show me an income method number one opportunity right now, and that's probably because the stock pulled back. Even though it's up 5.8%, the 55 strikes where I'd have to sell that call at or above the put strike are not lowering the risk by the one-third to one half general rule of thumb requirement for income method number one. So we're starting off with the income method number three. And I could roll up to the February 57 and bulletproof the trade. But remember, I started with a July, sort of ruining positions here. Uh, not ruining, I'm shortening time by too much, okay? And then here, the income method number six position shows up, where I could do that bear call spread. The nah, premium is not that great, but it's a viable bear call spread that would reduce the risk. Why are one and four not shown? Because even though the stock's up 5%, the stock's not above the put strike price, so it doesn't make sense to do a four now. I kind of cheated if the stock was at 55.10, we'd see fours and more. We'd see a lot of ones too, probably at the 56 strike, but we're not seeing ones now because nothing at the 55 strike is reducing this risk by a third to a half within the 45 day time period. But if they're there, this will show it. Let's change this. Okay, let's edit the position one more time for you, and then we'll get to, I'm sorry, we'll get to the other questions right away. I'm going to edit this position, not that position. Went to the wrong portfolio. We're going to edit this position one more time. I'm going to cheat again to show you an example. Let's say instead of the 55 when I bought the stock at 50-50, I bought the July 52 and a half put. at 575, just a guess, okay? So now I'm still at 5.8%, stock is above my put strike price. My original risk was 6.7%, a little bit higher in this case, because I went closer to at the money. 2.5% gain, okay, that makes sense, after seven days. Here's income method number one. Nothing that bulletproofs it, but I see that I could lower my risk to 2.7% by selling the March 54 call. February 54 drops it by more than half to 3% from 6.7. And doing the 54 calls also lowers it to 4.3. Here's income method number three again. And again, income method number four is not showing up in this case. So I'd assume that it would out to July. The 55 put should be a viable choice, but it's probably not reducing the risk by more than 2%, so it's not coming up, okay? All right. Okay, and so John B. asked another question. Their methods in the blueprint enable me not to have to be regularly online trading 11.30 p.m. to 7. Yeah, see, the blueprint techniques, the married put techniques are much slower, meaning that you don't, you're not trying to buy in and out of a call or in or out of a put or in or out of a strangle where you need to get 20% of the call premium in order to roll it effectively and more and so forth. What you're looking at is, hey, the stock moved up and I want to be able to put in a trigger here to sell the call to receive at least a third. Or if I roll the put when the stock's above the put strike price, it has to reduce the risk by half. Those might be some things you can set into your broker. And if you miss it on the first day, let's say the stock moves up $1.10 one day and you miss it, 
you can probably put a limit order in after hours and in the morning if the stock's still hovering around a 10%, you know, oh, I'm sorry, not 10%, drops 10 cents, drops 20 cents, moves up 10 cents or 20 cents, you're probably going to get close to the same premium to be able to roll that position. This isn't day trading. You know, I sh you see that there are a lot of income methods in this discussion, but I'm not rolling in and out of income methods every three to five days. I'm not trying to force income methods on a regular basis. This allows me more time. Time is on my side, number one, but number two, it's not day trading. You're not having to actively watch the market. If a big stock movement happens because of earnings, you can wait to do an adjustment the next day, and you'll probably still get pretty much the same benefit you would have if you're trying to watch it during the full day and pick the top or pick the bottom, honestly. All right, so let's move on now. Arvind question. Okay. Sorry, Arvind, I might need clarification on this, and you did send another one in, so let me check it. You say, thanks for your time. Please let me know that if I do repair for the option the same day as will be expired, then what happens? Uh, I, I don't know exactly what you mean. Um, so, okay, so what I'm going to say is that if I had to close a position today, I had to roll it because the option was expiring, and, and if I roll it today for the same expiration, then... Uh, I, I, I'm really confused here. Okay, let's go to AMAT again. Let me just put in a covered call for AMAT. I don't know what you mean. Uh, by repair, I, I, I'm assuming you just mean rolling um, or something along those lines. And I'm going to go to the January 53 call. All right, ignore the dates, ignore the prices. All right, so here's a covered call that was expiring today on AMAT. And let's go to the profit and loss chart. Now, as I got close to expiration, oh, sorry, I clicked the wrong one. My apologies, my apologies. Let's go back. Here's our covered call. So I have the 53 call and the stock's at 53.45, and I want to roll this call. Or I'm in a bull put credit spread where the stock is just below. Let's say I'd sold the 53.50 put, and bought a 5250 for a bull put spread and I needed to manage it. How did you manage it is the question. What I wouldn't do at expiration because nothing would give me any value but today as I got close at expiration I wouldn't buy to close the 53 and sell to open the 54 on the same expiration. Wouldn't get any premium. It wouldn't be worthwhile. All I've really done is close this. Okay, sure, the 54 might have expired, but I would have only gotten four or five cents, if that. I probably would have gotten one cent, if anything. Okay, so what you really would have done in this case, you would have bought to close the 53, your repair, and then maybe sold to open a January 54 at 47 cents. Okay, so, so you're rolling out in time. So what ends up happening? Nothing. This obligation is completely canceled. You bought to close this one at 47, sold this one at 49. You only gave yourself two cents of extra premium for the roll, but remember, you keep most of that 45 you already had. Okay, or you could look at it as it only cost you two cents to close this because you took in 45, bought it back for 47, and got another 49. So really, this is 51 cents. Either way you look at it, it's about 51 cents premium. I'm sorry, two cent loss. So either way you look at it, I'm sorry, it's, it's 47 cents premium. And you're now just out to January 19th. So you're not going to get a sign today at 54. Even if you sold the January 19th, 53 that was still in the money, you're not going to get a sign because that's for next week. Unless there was a dividend or something else, you're not going to get a sign early. So if you move it out in time, this obligation is canceled. You now just have a covered call out to January 19th. That's it. Same with a bull put spread. If you roll that short put out in time, well, the short put now is the focus is for next week. Again, you likely will not get a signed my January 19th call that I, or call or put I just rolled to will not get assigned tonight because I already closed the obligation for that one and the investors are for January 19th are focused on January 19th. Some event came up, something happened. Yeah, I might get assigned on that over the weekend, early, unlikely, but that's the case. Anytime you close an obligation, roll it, adjust it, Arvind, then it's uh, not going to be affected, okay? Um, All 
Okay, yeah. So um, you said you did a small mistake. Now, what you might have said is if you did a repair on a stock, the stock repair, the option repair, that ratio call spread. But now let's say I had applied materials at a cost basis of 56. And I used the stock repair tool up here to see ratio call spreads that would have helped me get back to break even. And you mentioned somewhere here, you know, option repair, but the same date, and it was today. Okay, well, let's say I had tried to repair my stock by, oh, geez, if it would have worked and it wouldn't, these numbers aren't going to be real, so bear with me. I'd say 50, 53. And let's say I bought 150 call for $1.10 when the stock had pulled down to 51. And then later I had sold 253s for 65 cents. All right, so I took in a dollar thirty, paid a dollar ten. I'm getting a twenty cent net credit here with a three point strike difference, and I hit expiration today. Okay, so this looks strange. It looks just like a covered call, but what it really is is a covered call. One hundred shares of AMAT at fifty six. Sold one fifty three call at sixty five cents. Okay, so that's my covered call, which is a loss, isn't it? This is a 53, so I get 53.65 back, which is a loss of minus 235. Remember, because I paid in 56. Now, I take in a credit of 20 cents. Okay, so we're going to add that into 0.20. Now, what I also have, that's one of these two short calls. What I also have is a bull call debit where I have a 50 and a 53 stri spread that I received at a credit. Okay, so that's the 20 cents. I didn't pay a debit here. That's received at a credit. So what does that mean now? Well, that means that at expiration, when the stock above 53, I get assigned the stock at 53, so I get $53 back. Remember, our cost basis was $56 into the stock. I get 53 back for assignment on the stock. I get three points back because at expiration, my broker is going to buy shares of stock for me at 50, the long call, to deliver at the other short call at 53. So we get another $3 for the difference in strike prices. And I received a 20 cent net credit for that repair. So now I'm out of the position entirely with a gain of 20 cents on a stock trading at 53.45 that I paid $56 for, okay? So if both strikes are in the money, Arvind, you get assigned on the stock, the remaining part of the bull call debit spread is closed and you get the difference in the strike prices back. If you did this at a credit, you keep the credit and that's the math. The original stock price minus assignment on one call, the difference in strikes for the successful debit and the net credit gives you your exit price here of 56.20, minus the original stock price of 56, that's your gain or loss on that position, okay? Uh, following this up, Rajiv says, deep in the money put assignment. Can repair to also suggest trade management for this? Yeah, assuming you're assigned, okay? Deep in the money put assignment, absolutely. So if I had sold the 57 put here when the stock was at 58, for example, and then it fell, and I got assigned, and I collected 75 cents, well, I now have a cost basis, Rajiv, of 65, 20, wow, my math is terrible today, 56, 25 for the stock trading at 53.45. That's not that deep in the money I know, okay? But all I have to do now is go up at the top, go to the stock repair, uh, 56.25, and to keep it safe, 100 shares. Just plug it in, Rajiv. So nothing for January. That's fine. But I see that I can repair the position here. Small net credit, one cent, and then 37 cents. But my break even is 54.62. Don't need it to go back up to 56.25. Here's one at 53.78 for March using the 53 and 54 strikes. Okay. So for repairs there, if you got put assigned, you'd be there. Okay. And that's what we're looking at. All right, so 
the stock repair when it happens if both are at the same expiration and you'll be assigned All right, regarding the picks of the day, going back to John, and, and sorry guys, I know uh, David's up next. Following David is Greg. Following Greg is uh, Rajiv's other question. I fast forwarded there. John, you've got another question about Australian, um, uh, Australian, which brokers to use that are helpful in Australia. So if anyone knows of any of the uh, brokers that are best to use for foreign investors, whether it be Australia, Europe, anything along those lines, interactive brokers, Thinkorswim. Anyone knows if any of you have, have traded outside the US or in Canada and you have a good broker that is uh, reasonable fees and reasonable for these kind of, uh, for foreign investing in US markets, let me know and I'll share that with John. I know Thinkorswim sort of took theirs off the market as did Options Express. They had stuff for Europe and for Australia as well as parts of Asia and they sort of removed all of them recently within the last eight months um, those sort of disappeared interactive brokers I'm not sure of okay so for John we want to go to covered calls now and he's talking about the monthly picks of the day and the weekly picks of the day what these are of course are uh, tested structures so if I go to weekly picks of the day, it shows me the top two weekly picks of the day. I'm going to be honest with you, I wouldn't touch this one. I'll show you why in a minute. It, and it's been fun. And the customer I have, I think he got a really, really strong profit on it after almost having a near heart attack. But I'll get into XNet in a moment. But these are the results of Ernie's extensive testing. And I've actually done now, and they'll be posted on Tuesday or Wednesday, Three years worth of historical testing for all of the covered call monthly and weekly picks of the day, the naked put monthly and weekly picks of the day, and the bull put uh, weekly default screens and the bear calls as well. Bear calls have not been that impressive, and of course we know why. It hasn't been a market for bear call spreads, even going 90% probability and about 7% out of the money for a two or three week trade. It's not profitable over the last three years. It's kind of funny. It just kept breaking through strike prices. All right. So John's question, though, is that based on this testing, what Ernie did is he went back and he would play with the different criteria available in the search, trying everything from MACD to Bollinger Bands, combinations of Bollinger Bands and MACD and RSI technicals, fundamentals, in the money, out of the money, at the money, so forth. And what he found, his best results over the one-year period he started with, was the criteria that are posted. And he took the top two trades or the top three trades in each one. Okay. And when you click that link, John, it says, see how we developed these results? You see Ernie's full walkthrough of what he did. John's direct question is, are these opened on Friday? Uh, no. Should the weekly picks be placed on Friday? No. They were always placed on Monday. They were placed at Monday near the close. Okay, so it's only a five-day trade. We didn't hold them over the weekend. So although this shows up, I mean, we always show what's available, but the testing that Ernie did, the testing that I did, was based on opening it Monday, near or at the close, holding it for that four or five day period, neither getting assigned or closing the position if the triggers were hit, and then just opening new positions on Monday, not holding anything over the weekend. Is it necessarily a bad idea to hold them over the weekend to get that extra two or three day time decay, which is what you're thinking? If I sell it on Friday, I get an extra two days of time decay? I can't tell you because we didn't test that. I don't know how many weeks of the course of a year or two year or three year time period when the market opened up on Monday much lower than it closed on Friday, where it would have affected the weekly picks of the day or monthly picks of the day. Okay. Um, regarding XNet, even though it's appearing right now, some of you may have been with me on the webinar when I did this. Uh, some of you might not have been. This was way back maybe I think it's September, maybe October. Don't honestly remember the date. It's in there in the archives. Right away, you can see the fun. Let's go to a six-month, might even go three-month, but let's go to a six-month chart. Perfect. I can go three-month. I'm going three-month. Be more clear. And this was XNet. The customer called me up, and he actually did, he got in here. It was at the end of, that's what it was. It was the end of October, and on the monthly covered call, my apologies, it was around this time. It was after November expiration, nearing November. He got into XNet at 25, and he sold the 20 strike calls, 24.40 or 24.50. He got in the stock, 
and he sold the 20 call for 580. Okay, so his break even now is around a little bit under 19. It was like 1860, I think, right? Yeah, 1860. That was his break even. Well, that got violated with a vengeance four days after he got into the trade, and the stock's now down at 15. That's when he called me. He called me here and said, what can I do? And I said, well, you know, you got so much premium. Think about it this way. You own a stock right now at 1860 that's trading at 15. And I mentioned the stock repair. He could buy to close the call cheaply and do the stock repair. Or I said you could roll down. So we rolled down to the 17 and a half for December. Got a really good premium of about $3. Now his cost base is 1560. And at 17 and a half, he's like, okay, well, this expired. Should I sell the 20? Uh, I said, I don't know. Maybe you should just close it. Well, he sold the 20, and then the stock pulled back down to that 14, 15 range. And it was for this expiration, next week's expiration. And then it came back up. So he called me and said, I've rolled from the 20 to the 25. That cost him a lot of money. And then today, poof, drops back down again. So this is a wild ride. And you can get a good premium and a good downside protection with that weekly one that came up with the stock at 1618 and selling the 15 call or 1660 and selling the 15 call. But again, it's been as low as 12 and I'm not saying it might not drop below 10. Okay, this thing has been wild and moving, not the safest trade in the world. But you consider it when he got in at 2420, it was down 50% at one point. He had cut his cost basis down to $15. Then he had a profit over here when the stock was at 17, even though he got in at 24.40. Could have gotten out with a profit here and probably should have. I don't know. He's still profitable. Yeah, he's still profitable right now, even though he rolled up to the 25 and put more money in. No, he's not. I'm sorry. No, he's not. His cost basis went up to about 17, 50, or 18 with a 25, so he's looking at a strong premium. But again, he's not profitable on this anymore because of the rolling up and down. All right, this is a question that I'm going to answer. This is a question where David's not necessarily going to like my answer, and I do apologize for that. But again, it's something that I've, I, I've talked about before. There's a webinar I can point you to, but in order to answer your question, I've got to go and add our bull call debits in. Let me take out iron fly and iron condor. I want to see bull call debits, David, and I want to see calendar calls. Whoop. I already have it in there. Okay, save configuration, folks. David question. David's question. Bull call debit spread. We looked at a bull put a little bit ago where we mentioned it, but in a bull call debit, I'm going to sell an at or slightly in the money call and buy a deeper in the money call to pay a premium. My goal is that the stock stays above the strike prices. I close out the position and get the difference in strike price is back. So, of course, the net debit is always less than the difference in the strike prices. And my return is equal to the difference in strike prices minus the net debit. And the return would be divided by the net debit, what you paid. Okay? So, in general, on a five-point spread, I might pay a debit of 380 to 420, depending on the time frame, if it's a weekly or so forth. Okay? I want it to be in the money, whereas the bull put spread, it's a parity traded bull put, where the bull put, both options expire worthless, and the bull call, both stay in the money, we close it out for the premium. David's direct question is, what is the best deltas or delta difference to look for when you trade a bull call debit spread, and how do you make money trading them? Well, you make money trading them when the stock is above both strike prices. There's so many ways to approach this, David, and this is where the question comes in. Number one, I do not pay attention to delta difference or what's called delta ratio in a bull call debit spread. Okay, to me, that is irrelevant. Why? Because they're the same expiration. It's just like a bull put credit spread. What I want out of my debit spread is a, prob a reasonable probability that both options will remain in the money, a reasonable return based on the net debit to the difference in strike prices, and instead of using delta of the short option as a gauge of how deep in the money should I go, I use probability. Okay? So, what am I talking about? Let's go into the search. Ernie's philosophy, my philosophy, we approach the debit spreads, especially if you're trading a weekly or two-week or three-week out, the same way we'd approach a bull put. Meaning, I'm selling a call option that's below the stock price, looking for a good probability 
65, 75, 80 percent or more. It's not shown here. I apologize. I don't have it. Let's let's go ahead and add the columns. So I'm going to choose columns here real quick, and we're going to put in everything that she wanted to see. Probability. Ah, there we go. Short option delta, long option delta, delta ratio. Okay. Let's go ahead and close that. All right. So here the short option delta is 0 0.72. And you see here they range from 0.72, oh, let me get the highlighter, David, sorry, in this area here, 0 0.73, 0 0.80, and so forth. Now, you can kind of relate that to being a probability. What do I mean by that? A delta of 0.72, this is for the short, my pivot. So 0.72 might be a 72% probability above and close to an 86 percent probability above with a delta of 0.86 for the 56 call on American Airlines. Okay, And then of course the long option delta, well that's irrelevant and to me the delta ratio is irrelevant too. Because okay? I'm not concerned on that. What I'm concerned is does this return for the difference in strike prices and the net debit shown as a negative net credit match my goals for leverage strategy? The delta ratio to me here is irrelevant. What I need to know is the, the difference in strike prices, this one and a half dollar strike, 82.50 to 84, with a debit of 115, does that match my return? What am I getting out of this? Well, I'd get a dollar fifty back or 45 cents, 35 cents, on an investment of 115, 30.4% return. Okay, does that match my goals for a seven day trade, 14 day trade? Now, you can see here I've set probability not using delta for the short or for the long or for the ratio because I'm more concerned with staying in the money on this strategy. Why am I not using this delta ratio? Because I don't care what the long option delta is or the ratio between the two. I care about my probability of this expiring in the money and being successful and that the return matches my goals without taking on too much risk. Okay, good. All of these do not have earnings between now and expiration. Delta ratio to me only comes into play when I'm doing any form of a diagonal or calendar spread. And you can consider a diagonal spread, a bull call debit spread, just where the long option is three, four, five months out in time or further out in time. It's a debit spread structure. It's a bull call debit spread structure. But I focus on that when the option, my long option is further out in time. Why? Because I'm buying maybe three months out to six months out, depending on your structure, and I'm selling 14 or 20 days out. So I want a delta ratio here of 1.6 or so. Why? Because in the first right cycle, if the stock moves up, I want to make sure I'm gaining at the start about 60% more on my long than I'm losing on my short. These two are the same expiration. They're going to gain and lose together. If this goes up a point, they're both just getting closer to intrinsic value. If it goes up another point, they're both just getting closer to intrinsic value. This I'm worried about the effect of it getting too close to intrinsic without retaining the time premium. That's why the delta ratio is important on a diagonal, not on this. Okay, not on a standard bull call debit. In my opinion, my opinion's not always correct. My opinion doesn't always satisfy every investor's needs. Okay, but that's what I'm looking for. Now, that being said, this is a conservative 72-73% probability bull call debit spread on iRobot, a net debit of 115, maximum profit of 35 cents, which is a 30.4% return for a seven-day trade with about a 72% probability. Some investors will take this a different way. And instead of going in the money on your debit spread, and selling the 84 and the 82 and a half with a stock at 87.19, an investor might consider buying an 85 and selling a 90, much lower cost, 35% probability of maximum profit, okay, but more of a one-to-one -one ratio. The investors that do that are going out to February. They're not doing these as weeklies. They're going out to February, maybe even March allowing more time for the stock to move in their direction because they're playing an out-of-the-money bull call debit. Does it make sense? Well, let's take a look. I could sell the, I could buy the 85 call for March for about 830, 840, it would cross earnings, and sell this for 590. Okay, 
So I'm going to sell the 90, buy the 85. It's an out-of-the-money spread. One-to-one -one risk reward ratio. The cost, the debit is 245. I'm get, looking to get five points back, so it's 255. So for a 90-day trade, it's 100% return. Okay? But you have to start out of the money. And you're speculating on growth over the next three months for this bull call debit for the stock to go above 90 to where you can close the position. In this case, is the delta ratio a little bit better, even though the same expiration? Hard to say. Okay, really hard to say in that case. It can be very profitable with this out of the money. And does delta come into play here more than it does with the same expiration in the money as well? I think so, okay? It might do that as well. But in this case, there's so many different ways to approach it as well, okay? And I'm scrolling through these other ones as well uh, here. And Arvind, I'm looking at all the comments that came in. Thank you, guys. Rajiv just made a comment a moment ago. It says, for his purposes, he avoids doing the bull call debits. And that's a popular thought. They are parity trades. And I always compare the parity trades between the bull call debit and the bull put. Number one, that's only for looking shorter term and going in the money with our bull call debit spread as we saw, which would be out of the money on the bull puts. I am never doing this with a bull put credit spread. I'm never selling an in the money 90 put and buying an out of the money 85, even though it's a one-to-one -one risk reward ratio. Why? Because I can be assigned early at any time, meaning I have to buy shares of stock at 90 and the 85 put isn't covering it because the stock's at 87. Now I've got to turn around and sell the stock and mess around with all of that. That's why you don't do a bull put spread this way, but you might do a bull call debit because your short call is still out of the money at this time. Now, how do you make money if I did this long term? Well, you make money when you can liquidate the position for any debit that matches your goals that's greater than 245. So at any time, I can probably sell to close my 45 and buy to close my 90. And if that credit I get back is greater than 255 or 245, whatever you set your cost basis and your goals at, sure. Does it make sense? Now, I'm not saying 255 profit. I'm saying 255 for a 10 cent profit. I could close this at any time, but does that match my goals for the position? Probably not. Probably not. Okay, that does. That's probably not going to meet my goals for that. So yeah, I'd have to wait longer. I'd have to wait closer to expiration. But of course, the minute that my long option starts to drop below this net debit, and this is getting to zero, that's when I start losing on the position as well. But you'd never do a bull put credit spread this way. And the bull call debits, when you do close them, as Rajiv just mentioned. You paid a spread position, spread commission to enter. You've got to pay a spread commission to exit. So it's twice the amount of commissions usually in order to close this position. Okay, now let me scroll up here. And Arvind, I see your other question coming in, but I've got so many other questions to get through. Not that that's a bad thing. We've got other questions to get through as well here. So let me go up. Okay, let me just go through here. So for John B., uh, everyone stepped up here. Arvind says in Canada we use TD Waterhouse and Quest Trade. Not sure if they're available in Australia. Uh, John uses Interactive Brokers in Canada. Um, yeah, there's that comment there. Yeah, the brokerage amount would be doubles as well. Let's see, I had another couple comments there also. Oh, Rajiv is using E Trade. I'm not sure uh, there that that's what he's using, and. Um, I'd say, oh, another one for interactive brokers. Okay, so those are some of the ideas. I know that, uh, you know, you talked about interactive brokers here. There's one called uh, Quest Trade that was mentioned from Canada. Um, E-Trade might still have ones there as also, okay? Yeah. All right. Um, so that was David's question. And then everyone's question is done. Greg's been patient. Greg's going back to the radioactive positions. When selecting between two radioactive trades, each one has a percent at risk between 5 and 8%. Should I choose the one whose stock price is only 2% away from the put strike price versus the one that is 4% away from the strike? Great question. Great question. Two answers. <laughs> First answer, go with the one that has less to move to get to the put strike price, the 2%. Okay. Um, let me see here. Percent in the money. Don't have it as a filter on this, do I? Not on this one. Okay. 
but let me just do percent in the money on the put of, I'm sorry, whoops, two to five. Let's see if we have anything, okay? All right, good. So these are the married puts that came up. And let me find two, oh, let me just pick a strike, let me pick a stock price. Let's say instead of this range, 55, oh, that's good, that's good. I'm going to go 54 to 62, okay? What? Ah, sorry. Let's go 50 to 66. There we go, okay. So they're not all in line. Well, these two were close. Timus, T-Mobile, and NTAP, okay? Both 65, oh, that doesn't help. Both 65 strikes, so they're kind of close here. Uh, but let's say one was the 65 and one was the 67 and a half. Uh, and both are within the risk range. I would be tempted to go with the one that's closer to the stock price. That means I need less movement to where it makes sense to do an income method number one or maybe even an income method number four. Time also comes into play. Okay, so, you know, if one's 217, it's 154. Let's say they're both same range out in time. One's 2% in the money, one's 4%, both in a risk of 5.8%. I typically take the one closer to the put strike price. If and only if, you know, the one that needs a less movement, Greg, if and only if I feel that this stock has the best potential based on how you look at stock charts and projections of stock prices, only if you feel this stock is the one that does have also the strongest potential to move up 3 to 6% in underlying price in the next 30 to maybe 50 days, around 45 days or so. That's what I look at first. Is I'm The first thing I do after I see all my numbers, I restrict it based on my cost basis, what I can afford, what risk I want, which is usually under 7.5%, personal preference, no statistics for you whether that works better than taking ones that are in the higher 8 or 8.5% range. But the next thing I do is look at the stock chart from the one on the top of the list. And if I look at the chart and some of the other uh, details from the more information button, and I don't feel confident that this is really good movement and could show me a 3 to 6 per gain the next 30 to 60 days, I'm going to forget about it and move to the next one. If you feel both are strong candidates to move up 3 to 6% in the next 30 to 60 days, both of them have a risk in your range. Again, we're assuming that this one was at the 67 and a half strike, where the risk would be lower, actually. But even in that case, let's say this was the 67 and a half on NTAP with a risk of 4.1%, I'm still probably more tempted to go here if my sentiment on the underlyings is the same. So it needs less movement for me to make sense to do one of the income methods on the positions, even though it has the higher risk. But again, personal preference. I do have radioactive traders who don't look at anything with a risk of higher than 5% because they're more focused on being conservative. If that means they have to wait longer to do an adjustment or an income method, that's fine because they're starting off with a risk of only 4 4 4.5%. Some of the positions I take are 6 7 7% all depends on personal preference. But in general, yes, Greg, I'm going to take the one that's where the put is closest to the stock price on two similar positions. In this case, they're both about even. In this case, it's hard to tell. I haven't looked at NTAP at all. But in this case, I might still actually be tempted to go with T-Mobile because it's 60 days extra of insurance with only a 0.5% increase in risk at the same strike. That's another comparison you could look at. Okay. All right, uh, Rajiv asked a while ago, is it advisable to create a bull put or bear column positions based on highly volatile commodities like UNG? No, I, I'm really sorry, I don't think so. I, 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 I tend, tend to want to avoid volatility and things that are subjected to commodity movements, sales up and down, uh, and so forth, mining. Is kind of dangerous sometimes with the bull put spreads because of swings in that. Uh, let's just take a look at UNG. We've got a good run. It's bullish or bearish, but we've only had a good run in the last three weeks. I mean, this this to me screams 12 months of bear calls, doesn't it? Well, not really. Here you would have, yeah, here you would have gotten burned. Here you're good. Probably would have gotten burned here. Here you're great. 
here you got burned. Okay, so one, two, three, maybe four times out of 12 months, you got burned with bear call credits. You did bull puts, you got burned eight out of 12, <laughs> depending even on how far you left and, and so forth. So that's, that's the best there that I can suggest. It's really hard on the commodities unless you have a really strong performance analyzing the commodities. You know the global markets really well. You pay attention to the global news and the global market markets very well. But hey, if I'm in here and I'm watching this, I'm thinking, hey, this is a great opportunity for a bear call. This probably would have matched my criteria for a bear call. And I enter the bear call here, I'm at full loss a day and a half later, four days later. You know, nice little gap. Let's go to one month or three months, let's say. Uh, that it's it's risky. But just everything's in that sense is risky because you don't know what's going to happen in a sector. Remember my AMAT position. It went up to 60. I did income method number four. I cut the risk down by 2.3%, down about 4.5% from 6.8. It looked really good. And five days later, the NASDAQ took a hit. AMAT was still a strong performer, but all the semiconductors got nailed and the NASDAQ got nailed. Before I knew it, the stock was down to $49 six days later. Okay, I have a low risk on it, and it was unexpected, and that can happen. But there's so much that can be affected you know, by just someone pulling out of one agreement or another that's been in place for years and years and cause a swing one direction or the other. Yeah, you can go deep out of the money. You can get to 90%, 85% probabilities on those positions um, to have a good probability of it expiring worthless, but things can swing very quickly, very fast. Okay, so it's kind of hard. Volatility is great, but remember, there's, there's a trick on volatility, and I don't even think this is that volatile, is it? Made a liar out of myself. Yeah, the volatility is huge here, 3.08 on UNG. The implied volatilities are just as high. This stock is at 25.28 with an extremely high volatility, relatively high volatility. Okay, uh, let's go to the option chain. Let's go to January. Uh, we'll keep weeklies. Why not? This might have earnings coming up too. I, I should have checked that. Oh, I'm sorry, not earnings. Uh, no dividend. Okay, okay. All right, so here we are at UNG. The implied volatilities, actually, they're not that bad at the midterms, but I just want to go to puts. All right, so the at-the-money ones aren't too bad as far as implied volatilities. They're not as concerning as I thought they might be. Um, puts, probability. Ah, it's just easy. Yeah, see, there's no premium here on the weekly. But, okay, let's, let's take this. This is only a 65%, 68%. 58% probability of expiring above. I mean, that's that's not going to do it. We're going to have to go further out. Let's go to February 2nd, shall we? Much better. 24 strike, 22 strike. But a 62 cent, 24 on a bull put, 22 on a 13. Okay, so I'm going to use 62 and 13 cents for that spread. Uh, the volatility is there, 0 0.46, 0 0.48. Okay, 24, 22 spread. Let me go here and 21 days out in time to February 2nd. We're going into the bull put search now. Okay. Should have done something different here, but that's okay. I'm going to adjust it in just a second, guys. Ladies and gentlemen, I should say, yeah. Okay, nothing there. Okay, let's knock that down to 15. Just making some changes here. Spread differences too, that's fine. That's fine. That's fine. Oh, I'm going to have to take this out. Just for comparable looks, potentially. There's got to be a good bull put in this range. You're kidding me. All right. Um, I 
That's funny that I can't find, oh, I know why. Let's try that again. Let's go 10. Last chance, and then I'll just pick one. Anyway, what I was going to show you is that you have a volatility of about 0.45 on that $25 stock, $25 ETF on UNG. Not finding anything. Okay. I'm just going to do it very quickly. Just bear with me one second. I'm going to clear this out. Doesn't matter. Yeah, I'll go to February and uh, implied volatility less than 2.5. Fundamentals, oh, sorry, technicals, historical volatility less than 0.5. All right, so what I'm searching for is a married put out to February on a low price stock, percent max risk less than 10, greater than 1. All right, see what we get. Wow. I want it lower. I'm trying to look for a volatility that's lower than that. There's nothing out there, huh? That's why. All right, sorry, last chance. Okay. Probably restricting it too much. In any case, when you're talking about higher volatility for a spread, in that sense, remember that the combination of the spread is the difference between two positions. It's the difference between your short option and your long option. Okay? So if one is higher, then the buy option is going to be higher as well. Meaning that if it has a higher implied volatility and your sell premium looks really strong, then that also means that the buy option is going to be really high compared to other options at the same position. Does that make sense? You know, so are you really getting much advantage of the volatility? Let's just go to cover call search. Oh, there's one right there. I should just take that one. But okay, hold on one second. I'm going to use Ultra Clean. Let's just take a look at this one here. So the stock research. Okay, so remember UNG was at 4.38 volatility and 4.5. This is at 0.52. And the implied volatility of the, the calls here it's about the same. It's at 0.49. So I was hoping to see that a little bit lower there uh, on this particular one. But again, let's take let's clear some of this out. Sorry, folks. I just want to clear all of our some of our discussions out here. Go back to this. I'm going to take UCTT and go to the profit and loss chart. Now, the stock's at 23.22 instead of 25. Let's clear all this out. Let's look at the February puts. Yeah, see here are the 20 and the 17 and a half. For the 22 and a half, which might not have a 70% probability, but here we're looking at a 70 cent net credit, $1 and a 30 to 45. So it would be at about a 70, 75 cent net credit where the UNG one was about 50, let's just call it 50 cents, okay? I go lower now, yeah, and I'm looking at about a 20 cent net credit with a higher probability in this case. So what I'm just getting at is that if you're, see here it would only cost me 12 cents, that was about the same, and here it was 45, but the UNG one didn't look like a bad spread percentage-wise at all, I'm just saying that when you pay more, when you get more for the short option, you're probably also paying more for the long option. As a comparison, you'll go a couple strikes down here, 24 is at 71 and the 22 is at 16. So you're looking about a 50 cent net credit. Okay. But again, it all depends on what you want to look at going forward as well. Okay. And that's the same. Um, I'll have to answer Jim via email here. We've been on an hour and a half, and Jim had, Jim had asked, uh, how do you learn about MACD? Well, that's on the site as well. Uh, I believe there's an archive webinar on the technical indicators also um, that you can take a look at under the is it options concepts. It's 
applied volatility. It might actually be discussed here um, as well. But yeah, there's some other information related to the MACD also. Um, I don't think I'm going to get into this, but Sam, I'll, I'll look at it real quick. I'm just going to talk about it. Sam says, what do you think of Netflix? I bought the stock when the drop came in at 190, a bull put at 295, two weeks left. I was really surprised in the movement. And buy puts lock of I don't know. I, I haven't looked at Netflix long enough to even consider where it is. I don't even know where it is. All right, we're at 221. Your bull put is fine with two weeks left. If you get an 80% profit, I'd consider closing it early. If you've made 80% of what you expected to make, um, and looking to buy out the puts and lock in the profits. Yeah, I mean, that's that's a good idea. I usually target, if I'm in a bull put or a bull call debit, as we discussed a little bit earlier, you know, if I received a dollar for the credit, and I can close it for 20 cents before the move up and two weeks beforehand, I make 80% of the maximum return I expected to make. I might go ahead and take that off the table. That sounds pretty good, right? Um, also, as I mentioned, with considerations of the market sentiment and what we saw before, might not be a bad idea also to consider closing it if we start seeing a drop next week. But you're still good because even if there's a 10 uh, point drop or a 15 point drop, you're still pretty far out of the money with that spread. Now it's going to spike an increase with implied volatility, so that could be part of the problem is for closing it early. But that target, you know, covered calls, cash secured, naked puts, when I'm at a point where I can close it and get 80% of the expected profit, I may take that off the table and look to move forward as well. All right, ladies and gentlemen, it's 6 p.m. Eastern time. I think that was all the questions that we had. Unfortunately, Jim left early and didn't get a chance to talk about MACD. We'll approach that later on in the week, probably in a blog or something else along those lines uh, for Jim and for anyone else who's interested on our thoughts on MACD. As I mentioned, I'm pretty sure there's a blog article and there's discussion in the webinars on MACD and some of the other technical indicators as well. <coughs> Excuse me. For those of you who haven't, as always, remember you can go to PowerUp.com at any time and go ahead and put in your first name, last name, and email address uh, to get that 14-day uh, free trial. We have access to all of the tools there. And, um, of course, no credit card information is needed as well. Uh, the subscription levels after that, $40 per month for the end of day, which only updated at the end of day data, $60 for the delayed service, and we do offer the real-time service for $120. And you can upgrade the delayed service and the real-time service to include the historical backtesting tools where our data goes back to April of 2006, so a little bit over 10 years of data as well. And, of course, as I mentioned, you can check out the blog at any time. Just go to blog.powerop.com see any of the free education uh, or the webinars page. You know, I can send everyone the link there. It's powerop.com slash webinars.asp and you can review our archived webinars also at any time uh, to look through the different Friday discussions, which is under the requested topic section, the options concepts, the options strategies, and just the basic tools presentations as well. And anytime you think of another question, send me an email to support at powerop.com. You can also reach us at support at radioactivetrading.com. And remember, call us during market hours at 302-992-7971. Market's closed on Monday. I'll try to get this webinar posted for you, the recording of it posted for you this weekend. Sam, I do believe we missed your original discussion on DOW and UDAO, uh, meaning that I don't think the I don't think I hit the recording when we started that conversation, so I think we missed part of it. Uh, but I'll check the recording and see what we have there and move forward, and I'll get the recording posted sometime this weekend. Market closed on Monday, extended three-day weekend. We'll see what we have in store for us on Tuesday. Take care, ladies and gentlemen. Have a fantastic weekend. We'll see you soon. Good night.